Hello and welcome to the Home Computer Museum in Helmand in the Netherlands. This place is amazing. There's so many machines here, rare ones too, which we need to have a look at. We need to look at all these machines, all of them. Yes, on the 1st of February 2020, Octavius and I flew out to Eindhoven in the Netherlands and then, thanks okay, to Bart... So we've been picked up at the airport. This is Bart. Hello. Hey, what's your position at the museum? Uh, I clean the toilets. He cleans the toilets at the yeah. museum. Drove about 10 miles to Helmond, where the Home Computer Museum resides. We had been invited to the opening of the museum's new, larger premises on the 2nd, and given that a return trip on Ryanair was about £50 and the museum looked amazing, I thought, why the hell not? We also had the opportunity to take a look round when it was closed, giving us free reign over these incredible and rare so, machines. Here, there's, there's some organisation here, so here we've got a row of Atari STs, we've got the uh, original detached keyboard version of the ST here, next to Commodores, Commodore 64s, Tandy Color Computer 3s, look at all this equipment, Tandy 1000. This is a huge gathering of machines. Apple 2GS, this thing, look at this! Looks like it's out of a nuclear 2000 here. Apple Macintosh 20th anniversary. Over there, we've got TRS-80. This is a rare, this is a TRS-80 Model 16B, which came after the Model 2. Don't touch that, that's my computer. Here's one of the original TRS-80s, which uh, apparently some bloke owned from new in 1978, 79, and he didn't get rid of it till 2001, and it came here. It's been fully upgraded. Uh, look over here, there's a Commodore Kim-1. There's a Sinclair, Sinclair MK14, there's an Acorn system. The consoles are very much kind of relegated to the sidelines. This is more of a computer museum, but there's still an area dedicated to it, which, you know, it's nice. And then we get a massive line of IBM PC compatibles and the like. So this is a row which dates most operating systems up to XP. We've got XP here, but we go back with Windows Millennium Edition, unfortunately. Windows 2000, 98, 95, OS 2, Windows NT 4, and it was paired with relevant machines to match each operating it system. It goes all the way back to Windows 1. You've got a, a, a Laser Turbo XT machine. So, we're going to take a look at this museum and look at some individual computers in more detail and just get a feel for what's going on here because this is a good place to be. Plus, we've got one of these uh, bikes which we never really had in the UK, but apparently they were popular in, uh, in the Netherlands. I tried one, I nearly died. Okay. Okay. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> the seat! <laughs> Look, this is, this is the PS de Resistance, <laughs> <laughs> the highlight. Where are you from? Nice. Um, this is, uh, uh, what was it, two days ago? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an original. That is the highlight of this. Look at that donut we found yesterday. It really is. Look at that. It's a mass. Real life Spice Girls, the official story. It is, look, it's all the stories about all of the girls. Oh, I should make a video on this. On. Boyfriend, spice portfolio. Bit of spice can't go wrong. Just having a meal. Look, look at, at them, they're all hanging out. Look at, that. look at this, there's pictures drawn by them. Look at that. They're the fans, not them. Oh, okay. Not the, they were like 20 at the time. Oh, wow. Well.
evidently. There's lots of wonderful toys here. I could spend weeks just looking at them. But I decided to catch up with Bart Vandenacker in the archive area to discover how this museum came to be, whilst also being distracted by the incredible number of items back there as well. I, I'm a weird guy. I started with Tendi, so <laughs> my, my first computer I, I've ever touched was a Tendi TRS-80 Color Computer 2. And then a few years later, we received our first IBM clone, which was also called Clone. Clone? Clone. That's basically the Dutch translation for clone. Oh, is it? it it's just called clone? Yes. <laughs> it's like, That's what should we call it? It's clone. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> that'll do. Just whatever. <laughs> I was always interested in computers, and at some point I saw this Philips P2000C standing there, and I thought, let's try it. Let's see what I can do. I was around 10. Uh, so I bought it for 10 guilders. I dragged it my home, uh, to home, 10 yeah. kilos. <laughs> wow. <laughs> on my bike. Well, on a That's bike? Amazing. Bloody hell. <laughs> uh, and then suddenly people start to give me all these computers. And at first, uh, uh, it was the first computer I got, I think, was an MSX. Then somebody uh, gave me an Amiga 600, and uh, that's uh, where the. Uh, this shit happened because uh, I was, uh, that was the most beautiful machine I've ever seen. Mm. The Amiga 600. By the time I was 16, I had 35 computers. When you had friends over, were you just like, which switch computer do you want to use? <laughs> You'd think I have friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I thought it was a long shot. So how did you get the, the funds together to start the... Uh, I did the Kickstarter and it failed. Out of, out of the blue, I got a call from a guy um, and he said, and I really loved your idea. So I'm going to invest the full amount of money in you yeah. so you can get this museum up and running. And uh, together with my own money, and um, I got a little money from uh, the uh, local uh, uh, city council. We got a, li a little bit of money, not much, but uh, in total we had about 25,000 euro to start mm -hmm. the museum. It was really hard work. Absolutely, it was crazy and, and I had so many pain. <laughs> Physical pain. Yeah, I bet. Uh, as soon as people knew what we were planning, people started to donate by themselves. So I think about the time we opened, we had 400 computers. The last count we did, we were at 1,500. Whoa. Is this the only storage yeah. area you have? Is this, yeah. It looks like you're probably going to need to expand it again <laughs> quite soon. <laughs> it's getting quite full. Uh, that's what I was oh, looking yeah, at. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a, a heavily modified Commodore VIC-20 and it was made. Um, the entire case is made by, by a guy and he really, really <laughs> did his best. Wow. Everything is so, so neat. Yes. Mm. Look at this cardboard fan holder. Look at yeah, that. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and this one uh, was meant to copy. It was only the, the only purpose it had was to copy cartridges. Oh, really? Yeah. They went to, to fairs and just copy cartridges. So was it, was this used in the eighties? Yeah. Did I hear you right? Did I hear you saying that you're gonna make a copy of a game without paying? There's just so much to see here, too much to condense into a reasonable length video. I mean, look at this Commodore Media Tower. This is a device from 2006, shortly after the Dutch company Yeronimo Media Ventures had nabbed the Commodore brand from Tulip Computers. It comprises of a dual screen tower with a Windows based PC running below the surface. The idea was a one-stop media kiosk, serving up music and films, all downloadable on request. A user would walk up, choose what to download, connect their Commodore Navigator media device, and off they go. It wasn't that successful, and only a handful were made, which makes it all the more desirable. Behind that is a device for printing vinyl characters. I love it has all these individual font cartridges inside. 
You know, this is the eclectic kind of random and rare old technology chucked together in one place that I really like. It's a bit like a larger version of my office. But rather than darting around, I thought it would be interesting to focus on a few specific machines from the shop floor. So I roped Bart in to give us a rundown, starting with the very machine which kicked this whole collection off. The Philips P2000C. It runs CPM. And it, it runs DOS with an expansion card. So. Yeah, uh, there's a 8088 expansion module you can put in with 512k of memory. Um, it has two Z80 CPUs, so it boots up using one of the Z80s. The other Z80 is used for I/O and video. And from CPM, you can start a special command, uh, and then you can boot into MS DOS. The drives are 640k. So it's also quite interesting, there's really special drives because they can read everything you throw at it, you can just yes. use them. So they're double sided, double density. Yeah. So what, 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 what game did you have with it originally? Do you uh, remember? Yeah, uh, I had a few games and I still have them because they're basically the only games that ever came out for this machine. Um, I had a game called Maze. Right. I had a game called Ladder, but that's a, a, a CPM game, all okay. CPM games. Uh, chess. Yeah. And uh, one sort of adventure and text adventure. This is uh, a DAI computer. It's a Belgium computer, actually. It's uh, a computer that's uh, really rare to have, uh, even in the Netherlands or Belgium. Uh, they are considered as uh, extremely rare. We also have this disk interface with it, which is even more rare. The DAI computer um, was originally intended to be a Texas Instruments TI-99, because Texas Instruments refused to make uh, the TI-99 available for Europe. So they asked the Belgian people, uh, can you make a computer for us? Intel 8080. The machine had 48K of memory, has 16 colors and four voiced audio. For that time, 1979, 1980, really extremely powerful machine. But Texas Instruments decided that they are going to release the TI-99 in Europe. So they said to the Belgian people, thank you, but no thank you, we do not need it. So they had this machine and they didn't know what to do with it, but yeah, okay, let's release it. So they did. They released the DAI computer as its own. When DAI decided to release this one, it used Texas Instruments chips. And Texas Instruments found out that they are releasing a computer, which was basically intended for them. Making the Texas Instruments refuse to deliver chips for this machine. Meanwhile, in the Netherlands, we had a Teliak, as it's called. They were making a course. And we're still talking about 79, 1980, so before the BBC. And they decided, we're going to make a course using this computer. So Teliak only had 1,000 computers delivered from DAI, and yeah, DAI couldn't deliver anymore, so they went to another computer, which was called XD Sourcer. The DAI uh, kept on going for another two years, a good two years. Uh, 1982, uh, the original company went bankrupt, then in data, took it over and sold the computer for another two years. In 1984, it was completely gone from the market. Uh, the Indata version is a colorful logo. You see dye in several colors. Uh, the original one is a green one. So if you see the difference between those two. That's the story behind the dye. Okay. So here we have the XD Sorcerer. Um, for those people who are reading along. Yes, it says Computata, but I will tell you why. XD is uh, from 1978. XD was known for its uh, uh, arcading, arcade machines. And uh, after the, the Commodore PET and the Apple II and the TRS-80, XD decided to get the best of all worlds together in one package. It's a Z80 based machine running, uh, well, it could run BASIC, it runs CPM if you want to. Uh, it's all running in uh, ROM packages you can put in the side called PAX. It also has the S100 expansion unit, so it's the fully S100 compatible uh, buses are in there. Um, it also houses a uh, disk controller inside, meaning you can actually connect this drive to it as you can see here. These are hard sector drives, or, uh, so these are really rare to get and really hard to copy, and, um, but we still have them. 
But for some reason, XD never got really good uh, sales in uh, North America, where the, where the company was. But as I just told about the Dai computer, uh, the Dai couldn't deliver and they had to search for another company. They chose XD Sorcerer as the system that um, for the course. So on the television and books and everything was on the XD Sorcerer. So the XD Sorcerer uh, was imported to the Netherlands and the company Computata uh, was made just to import these machines. In America, basically XD stopped producing computers and sold all the rights to produce computers to the Dutch people, to Computata. And Computata started to produce these computers. In 1983, the uh, successor of the Computata System 1, or the Computata uh, XD Sorcerer, uh, did, and that was the Tulip System 1. So the Computata changed their name to Tulip Computers. This one, unfortunately, is not working. Um, it is doing something special, quite extraordinary though. It, for some reason it can't find its normal RAM, so f it decides to boot on its video RAM. Meaning you can't do anything, but as soon as you do something, try to load CPM or try to put in a basic, it will use that memory and it can't find it, so it will crash. So. <laughs> it's over here, this is the very first computer that ever said Tulip and it still says Computata. That came out exactly one month before IBM entered the market in the Netherlands. So this is not an IBM PC compatible. It came out with uh, running CPM86 uh, but um, soon they decided to run MS-DOS. That's probably was better. It is a very old system. It has a really strange video output. It has a really strange output for the disk drive so it, it when I boot it up uh, it will just ask for a disk drive and I don't have the disk drive so okay. it's effectively not doing anything here. So on my travels I discovered that the Dutch love these sprinkles on bread for breakfast and I might have developed a small addiction to them which is why I want to thank this trip sponsor Surfshark VPN because with them I can get cheap flights back to the Netherlands. Oh yeah. You see, depending on where you're logging in from, things on the internet are often very different prices. If I was to buy plane tickets from Stansted to Eindhoven, I might find that they're £80 as it reflects the price that UK residents are willing to pay. But if I was to log in from a different country, perhaps India, I might get a significantly cheaper price. And that's just one of the benefits that Surfshark VPN can bring you. You see, when you log into their VPN, which is very easy, you can effectively access the internet appearing as if you were in a completely different country. This not only brings savings, but it makes it virtually impossible for you to be tracked on the internet. So if you want some Dutch sprinkles, or anything else for that matter, click the link below to use coupon code NERD and get 83% discount and one month extra free with Surfshark VPN. Now let's get back to the sprinkle um, museum. Let's get back to the museum. So let's recap our learnings so far. Not, not the sprinkles. We've learnt that the Dutch actually beat the UK with their BBC learning project. We've learnt the Dai had some problematic importing issues. We've learnt that the Exidy Sorcerer did pretty well off the back of it. And we've learnt that the Dutch brand Tulip Computers, who bought the Commodore name, were formerly known as Computata. I've enjoyed learning about all of this, but if there's one Dutch computer that I really wanted to know about, it was this giant hulking thing. I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> This is uh, actually a Dutch uh, computer, and uh, the original. Um, How do you pronounce it? Hey, hey, ha, 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 I like your pronounce. Uh, <laughs> as, I don't know because the guy who created it is dead. So oh, okay. um, I call it the Astedes. Okay. Because I have no idea. This is uh, created by uh, a person called Meneer, uh, uh, Mr. Klaassen. Um, he uh, was born in 1922. And uh, in Eindhoven, he created his own, his first design uh, company, just to design and draw. And then he moved to Hilversum, and in Hilversum in the 70s, um, he found out that uh, there was a lot of requests for digital design. 
so computer aided design. And uh, there was no computer back then who was able to do that. And we're talking about the Apple II, the PET 2001, uh, the 10 TRS-80. They were just not capable of doing design. So uh, he found a few very, very uh, smart people. And he put together a computer uh, with his idea to have a designer sit behind the desk and start to design without any knowledge of computers. Um, 1980, the first machine was released, the first Avstedas, uh, having 10 Motorola 68000 CPUs. Uh, it had three color monitors, the same monitors as, as they are here. They became display 16 million colors. Uh, there are three green screens on the, on the bottom. Um, they show data. And the original Avstedas had an 8 inch drive. And this one is the second one, yeah. it has the 3.5 inch. And this one has 68020s inside, including the FPUs, uh, the 68882. How many does it have? Four. Four 32 bit processors. Yeah. There's so. also a, a keyboard in here. You don't say this is not the keyboard, the main keyboard. There's one over here. Wow. How clicky is this? Not. No, it's a bit, a bit squidgy. The, the original Astedas costs no less than 300,000 guilders. We're still talking about 1980 at that point. <laughs> Which, uh, what does that translate to? Uh, roughly, so? I'd say a half a million euro. And that's without inflation? That's with inflation. That's with inflation, yeah. okay. Which is quite significant. Yeah. So the idea is, we've got the drawing area here, yeah. I presume, and then all these are for effects. It's, it's the hardware version of Photoshop. So we've got <laughs> we've got a bank of draw buttons here. So we've got polygon, point two, measure, frame buffer, paint, smudge, pixel. So yeah, it's got all the functions you would expect on Photoshop, but on a massive <laughs> keyboard. I actually found it on uh, on the Dutch eBay, um, and I picked it up. Uh, I can tell you, it doesn't fit my van. Uh, but we drove all the way from near Amsterdam or Hilversum uh, to here, which is uh, normally a trip of one and a half hour with my van sticking out with this computer in the back. Yeah. <laughs> like, there we go! <laughs> and this, what, how much does it weigh, did you say? 220 is? kilos. 270 kilos. Yeah, including the monitors, yes. Uh, hopefully we start this year, is going to fix this and get it up and running. Which would be amazing to yeah. see it in action. Yeah. And it will draw a lot of power, I can tell you as well. <laughs> yeah, you have to put your prices up. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> the logo of Heineken and the logo of, he of Amstel beer in, uh, on the bottles from the early 80s is made using a status. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And these uh, were sold uh, especially to car manufacturers to design. Uh, I know Volvo had one, I, uh, Volkswagen had one. So, do you know how many roughly there were of these? It's I have no idea, but given this has serial number 1483. Quite a few though, more than I'd expect at least. Yeah, wow. but I'm not sure if, uh, you know, it's, it's, I don't know which number they started with. Maybe they started with 80, so then True. only <laughs> sold three. Yeah. I have no idea, but the company still exists. Uh, Mr. Klaas died and I got it from his, uh, his daughter and uh, who had this in storage and uh, yeah we try uh, that's one of the goals we're going to make yeah, is fix this machine and get it up and running so you can die design like it's 1985. Excellent. Yeah. Now at this point we've probably climaxed in all senses of course there's much more to see and do but really the best way is to experience it because this place really is an experience. They haven't got all the wallpaper up yet, but a lot of these machines are in era-themed setups. What really makes this place special isn't just the computers and their stories, it's also the 70s chairs coupled with the veneered 70s desks, or the matching table lamps and cassette caddies sitting alongside these unwieldy juggernauts. The moment you sit down in that space, it feels like you've warped back several decades, and that's really what it's all about. The emotions that these beige and yellowing boxes produce. You know, sometimes you just need a striped chair to invoke a feeling of undeniable 70s exuberance. 
If that's not enough, then you could always have a blast on a game created in 1979. A Calabeth, World of Doom for the Apple II. This is an incredibly rare game and actually the precursor to the Ultima series. Created by Richard Garriott and featuring one of the very first implementations of a dungeon in first person 3D. And that sort of thing just isn't out of the ordinary here. Rare machines, rare games, rare accessories, rare chairs, even rare table lamps. It's all here waiting for you to salivate over, although probably don't do that as it's electrical. If you're local to Helmond or thinking about going to the Netherlands, it's worth taking a trip yourself just to get down and dirty with these glorious machines. I've got to give a huge thank you to Bart for inviting me over to the opening and to the volunteers at the museum for doing such an excellent job. It was really great to meet everyone involved. If you want a more detailed insight into our exploits, including visiting Helmand Castle, you can find a full vlog of the trip on my Patreon page. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> nah, you're right. <laughs> With access given for all supporters. Alternatively, if you want to see what wild and questionable antics we got up to for Octavius' video, I'd suggest checking out her channel and clicking the subscribe button. Hey, no, wrong platform. It's on That's platform four. Where's the platform? Platform four is there. Platform four. <laughs> no, you missed the train. I'll catch the next train. No, you're on the train track. Oh, you're literally Christ walking alive. across live tracks. <laughs> In the meantime, thanks for watching and have a great evening. Donut is gone. Oh, it's been replaced by these crappy old machines.